As you see, we have a panel of three expert politicians. <laughs> Stephen <laughs> is delayed. Uh, the Great British Rail, uh, as you know, will take me four and a half hours to get back to London via wherever. So he's on his way. So we'll get going anyway. And uh, hopefully he'll be able to join us in a minute. Now, we're really, really honoured to have two fantastic people. Judith Jolly has come all the way from Cornwall. So, you know, it's a fair whack coming up. And, uh, I did spend the night here. You though. did. And you came to our and party. Came to party. Mm -hmm. She's a Liberal Democrat who, in 2011, was appointed co-chair of the Liberal Democrat Parliamentary Committee on the Health and Social Care on health and social care, and actually was a great, uh, a really, really good person during the debate, during the, <laughs> during the uh, passage of the bill, and was uh, incredibly constructive uh, when we went with concerns. Councillor Linda Thomas, Deputy Leader of Bolton Borough Council, Chair of Bolton Health and Wellbeing Board, and the Labour Lead on the, local, on the LGA's Community and Wellbeing Board. Good morning. And, of course, Stephen Dorrell, who needs no introduction. Stephen, do you want to rest? I gather you've just come Comments, in. But, yes. Oh, no, no, not at all. We've literally just got going. And thanks very, very much uh, for coming. Conservative MP for Charnwood in Leicestershire, Chair of the House of Commons Health Select Committee, and, as we know, former Secretary of State for Health under the major administration. And I will say it on a public platform, I think the best Secretary of State for Health that we have ever had. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I mean it. <laughs> But of course, Mr Hunt is trying to challenge that, as we heard yesterday, and would like to be remembered as the most pro-GP. So you're in competition, Stephen. Right, the format is going to follow the same sort of format as you hear on the radio. We're going to ask some questions, and if your questions can be brief, and then I will put those uh, questions to the panel. Uh, the person asking the question, be prepared to give your view. We've got some pre-prepared questions. I mean, pre-prepared as in we've asked people to prepare them uh, just before, but it, others can, of course, uh, ask them, and I'll come to, the, I'll come to you uh, as we have uh, uh, with time. So without further ado... Can I ask uh, Dr. Ellen Wright to ask her question? Hello, good morning. I'm a GP in Greenwich and a CCG board member. And I'd like to ask the panel whether they think postcode rationing of NHS services by CCGs, and I'm not just talking about design of services, but actual treatments via treatment access policies and drugs via prescribing guidelines, is acceptable. And if they don't, do they think central government should be honest about the need for rationing in the NHS and support a national debate about what treatments and medicines should be available to all? So, panel, is postcode lottery, lottery acceptable? And if not, is, should this not be led by central government? Stephen, can I start with you? <laughs> Why not? Uh, there's two questions tied up in that question, I think, isn't there? Aren't there? Um, firstly, are the, when we make decisions about use of resources in the health service, does the, is that rationing? And secondly, should there be local variations allowed of those, quotes rationing decisions? If I can deal with them both, both questions, and I can only obviously offer a couple of sentences of observation on both questions. Uh, the health service is a cash-limited service. By definition, that means there are choices to be made about priorities. And if one uh, wishes to refer to that as rationing, there's, uh, the, 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 the euphemism preferred in the health service is priority setting. But if you have a cash-limited budget, there must be decisions about priorities. And yes, it is true, I think it's unavoidably true, uh, that ministers are ultimately accountable for uh, the choices that are made about the use of resources and should expect to be called to account for it. Should we allow local variation in that? I actually am in favour of that. It's pejoratively referred to as postcode rationing or postcode lottery. Uh, but the alternative is to try to run a single uh, set of priorities across the entire country, independent of local circumstances and indeed independent of local views. Uh, I'm in favour of engaging local clinical communities and br more broadly through health and wellbeing boards, local lay communities as well in decisions within their locality about the choice uh, of use of resources and that means if you're going if you're in favor of that that 
they must be free to make different decisions in different localities. So then we come back to the center, one of the core questions in, throughout the history of the health service is the balance between central and local. Is it a national service or is it a local service? The answer is that it's always been both and in my view should remain both. Thank you. So, Baroness Jolly, should you be able to get the same treatment in Cornwall as you do in Harrogate? Well, Cornwall and Harrogate possibly, but Cornwall and Ma we were having a discussion about Greater Manchester just earlier, and, and if you talk about Greater Manchester and Greater London, that looks nothing at all like, like Cornwall, Harrogate or Leicestershire. And, and in fact, what Stephen's just given us is, is the sort of the standard textbook reply, and he's absolutely right. And, and when the questioner, and I didn't catch some of your technical bits later, later on, but the basic sort of top line, the, the two things that I wrote down was firstly nice. I mean, nice has, has been there to say, these are guidelines and, and this is what clinicians should be doing. And the second one is this as aspect of localism. This government, and uh, as, a, as a Lib Dem, I'm very, very low down, down the sort of the pecking order within this government. But we're, we're very committed to local decision making. And I think we have to remember that we've not only got NHS England, we've got NHS Scotland and NHS Wales and Northern Ireland. And they too are, are sort of developing their own <laughs> protocols and their own standards. So I think it is inevitable that things might look different in different parts of the UK. Thank you very much. Linda, from the health and wellbeing aspect. Yeah, well, I'm very low in the pecking order. I'm just a chair of a, a health and wellbeing board in my um, low lib town of Bolton. But I think minimum standards, I think standards, uh, we shouldn't have a postcode lottery in the sense that everybody should have um, a, a decent health service at the point of delivery in, free in their own town. But I, I am aware that in an area like mine, the health inequalities are probably totally different to uh, a more affluent borough. Um, and, uh, but I, on, that, on that question, I would say that we need to have more um, resources, health resources in an area like mine to tackle those health inequalities. Now, that not, might not go down very well, say, in Harrogate, but um, the money is scarce that health and wellbeing boards are putting forward strategic plans, never quite sure that they're going to be able to meet the needs of the whole population. And my difficulty in all of this is the fear that locally we'll get the blame if there is a postcode lottery. So obviously from my point of view, no, there shouldn't be a postcode lottery. Thank you. And of course, I think at the birth of the NHS, Bevan said services should be available universally, but not necessarily uniform, which I think uh, covered that. You, you might not get it in Scunthorpe, but you, were, you, you could have it. You just might have to travel. So, but thank you very much. Can I ask now Stephen Summers from Newcastle North East to ask his question? Yes, sir. Is that with me? No. Talk into it. It is. Uh, I'm from Newcastle and on our exec for our CCG as well. Um, so this question actually is uh, something we discussed in our group. So just about the uh, transfer of resources into primary care. If the NHS wants to save money, which it does, and it seems generally agreed we uh, are trying to see a shift of uh, care into the community and hopefully out of the hospital, um, that uh, the barriers to this sort of change are immense. Um, most notably the inability for CCGs to commission primary care. Something actually that Jeremy Hunt seemed to be unaware of when he made the comment that CCGs uh, didn't have to open things up to tender uh, unless it was in the patient's interest in response to a question from a GP about why he was having to rebid for the second time for his practice. Um, I rather think he should have been picked up on that because we don't commission practices. Um, the, there are perverse payment incentives within secondary care um, and the question, well, there are many other barriers, but uh, the question is what would members of the panel like to see to actually encourage a shift of resources into, into the community setting? So Judith, we are seeing all the right conversations and all the right noises, but the barriers of, in terms of actually shifting the resources appear to be immense. And what's your sense of all of that? Well, it, it does seem to be a bit, a bit odd that NHS England commissions primary care and that CCGs don't, um, simply because primary care, community care is sort of locally based. Um, I think that as far as perverse incentives, I mean, 
Claire and I have had more conversations about Section 75 than, than anything else. And, and that, that's the legislation around this lot. And I think it probably still isn't right quite yet. But I suppose we're only six months into this new world. And there must be lessons that need to be learned. And I think something that you can do is to use the college to actually feed back and lobby back into the ministers. And if, if Jeremy Hunt didn't know about this, then perhaps we could argue that as Secretary of State, he should have done. And so that, perhaps that's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, but one, one area that you didn't include in any, in any of this discussion was actually the local authority. And I, and I, and I, and I shan't go on, because I feel the lady on my right certainly will. But you, local authority has to be involved. The local authority is in a really odd position in that an awful lot that it can do can actually keep people out of your, coming into your surgeries and into hospitals. But any money that comes out of their budget gets returned into yours. So there, there's, a, again, another conversation about how does this money in two separate silos work together? Thank you. So you, you see some, some shoots of, of optimism in all of this. Uh, if I'm, college, I'm, always, I'm, I'm a half full person. If a college acts as a lobbying group, unfortunately we're not a lobbying group and I'm sure we well, could no, no, be gone. You, but, but you are hugely powerful. I mean, I'm one of the No, 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 the, 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 our CGP. Yeah, no, I, mean, I we I, all I, know about you, Claire. No, no, I, Judith, I, 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 I think you're absolutely right, and I think it's not myself, but I think it's GPs through their various positions. But, uh, Linda, a challenge. It's all local government. It's you on the Health Well and Being Board. It's your responsibility. It's our responsibility, yeah. Well, we, we're used it's to being joint, the whipping boys. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a joint well, responsibility. Well, I would say that um, when the health... When the health bill went through, I, I was sort of part of the team that was challenging some of the things. And one of the things we said to Paul Burstow constantly, and I think I was the first person to say, could you give the Health and Wellbeing Board some teeth, please? And he said, what kind would you like? And I said, nice, sharp, shiny white ones. Because the fear is that you set your strategic plan as a Health and Wellbeing Board with your CCG colleagues, with the acute sector there, with all the providers there, and it's fine, and everybody agrees with it, until you get to the stage when the money starts to run out and then people retrench, re they? they go back to their, to their silos. What we're trying to do in local government is take the bull by the horns, basically, and we're talking now all the time about integrated provision. And I know very shortly there will be some authorities that will be named as pioneer authorities by the government. I'm hoping that Greater Manchester will be one. And on the other hand, we're hedging our bets. We're also working with my party, with Andy Burnham, on what he refers to as innovative councils. That's councils who do integration. So we're running parallel, if you like. Um, one of the things we've done in, in, in Greater Manchester, we have an overarching health and wellbeing board, but in, within each authority, there is, uh, by Christmas, there has to be an integrated plan and we talk very much about in my area about the Bolton Health Pound and we've got provisionally an agreement with the CCG with the acute sector with our sector because we have health we have adult social care we have public health that we will pool this money and we will we'll put the patient at the centre we will deliver the service for that patient and hopefully if we can do enough preventative stuff um, we can keep sort of some of our elderly citizens out of, out of uh, the acute sector in the, in the expensive hospital beds. The proviso is if we save money in the acute sector, that money will then be uh, kept as the Bolton Health Pound and it will be used to, to be spent on gaps in provision. Now, it's at a very early stage, but we have made that agreement throughout Greater Manchester. And I know if you go around the country, there will be other, uh, there will be other councils that have agreed. And we want to take the lead on this because we feel that we are the accountable body. It runs, I just said earlier, it runs through us like a stick of Blackpool Rock. We have to be accountable because every four years we have a, a, a judgment day when we have no right of appeal, whether we are on the council or not. So that's the bit that we can help. We don't want to be uh, clinicians, we, we, you know, that's your role. But we think together, if we can come to an understanding, we can, we can use the health pound in each area much better. And the big thrust is we've got to get community services Right, that's got to be embedded. So you heard it, and we'll keep them to account, that any money saved in the acute setting will be used and transferred for provision. How many times have we heard that? Can, can, I, can I just add something? That actually I meet very 
on, on an informal basis with the chair of our acute sector who has actually come from previously a community health council mm. and he has already put money across for the community services because he knows he's, he's his, his establishment is going to be bankrupt soon if he doesn't. Lovely, and words like pigs and flying sort of come to mind, but I'm sure... Stephen, I'll see you, you in a year's time, Claire. You've written a lot about integration, and the, your, and the Health Select Committee published a, a, an amazing document from your review not so long ago, all about how to get integration. So is this really going to happen and shift resources, or is it just another document that's going to pile up and, and never be put in action? Um, can I begin by stating the problem and then um, <coughs> responding directly to, what, to the question you ask? Because the problem, of course, is that all of these things, ministers have used words, as you said, sim uh, uh, very similar to these. For, I've used them as a minister and my predecessors did and my successors have. And uh, if uh, we know that when resources get tight in the health service, there's a danger that resources far from flowing into the community actually get hijacked by what's seen as the urgent and emergency cases in the hospitals. And actually resources get drained out of uh, primary care and community services to respond to the urgent headline need. And your successor, Claire, came to see me last week to say that that was an analysis that had been done by the RCGP, that this is already beginning to happen again. Uh, Judith used the phrase that there are two, as she referred to, two silos implying health and uh, social services. But in fact, uh, when you look at how commissioning works in this world, there are, in my view, there are five silos. There's primary care, there's social care, there's social housing, there's community health, and nobody's ever been able to tell me the difference between community health and primary care, and then there's the acute sector. And every one of them has a different commissioning system. The Secretary of State got one of his five commissioning systems wrong. He isn't even responsible for one of them in the form of social housing. Uh, and every time I hear people explain to me how you can have collaborative commissioning that will deliver integrated services, I become more convinced that that's, that argument is wrong, which is why, Claire, from the select committee point of view, we have advocated from the beginning of this parliament exactly the point I was listening. I was listening very carefully to what Linda, as a Labour councillor, was uh, saying about how we deliver integrated care to, to see if I could find a single word she used I disagreed with and I failed. Uh, the the, oh the, the development <laughs> of health and wellbeing boards as uh, the, the most effective Potent, uh, without, without going through another round of institutional change, which nobody wants, uh, the health and well-being boards, it seemed to me, represent the best chance we have uh, to deliver properly joined up commissioning. And until we've got that, we won't have properly joined up services. Uh, that's sometimes described as the Burnham plan. I'm quite happy to recognise Andy Burnham endorses it. We from the select committee angle uh, set it all out, have set it all out on more than one occasion in our reports. And in order to give credit where credit is due, we are, of course, talking about an organisation that was created by Andrew Langley's legis legislation. So it's a very good illustration, actually. Uh, if you get past the politics to look at the policy, sometimes the differences aren't as great as they sometimes appear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Judy, if you wanted I, to come back on that. I just want to make a, a very quick comment on the housing thing. And Stephen's absolutely right. Housing does have to be part of, part of this solution for a huge number of your patients. And one of the things that I didn't realise until relatively recently, that when the NHS was actually set up, housing was actually in, in the Ministry of Health. Mm. Um, and my colleague... Uh, Paul Burstow, who used to be minister until about a year or so ago, uh, has actually recently said that he thinks that's the place where it should return. So, so that's something just to, to ponder. Thank you. Do you want to come back on that? And then I'm going to ask anybody from the audience who has a question. You've got to come to the front. Um, I hear the comments about um, integration, and uh, I, I was very careful to say community um, work rather than primary care, um, you know, general practice. We're part of uh, a much larger system. Um, the, 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 you know, every part of uh, what's going on in the community needs to be resourced to a greater degree. And whilst I, you know, I fully agree with your comments about integration, there's only so much you can achieve from that. Um, we've got uh, very nicely integrated teams across uh, health and, and, uh, and the local authority for um, you know, uh, uh, community care. Um, but, and it's already doing some very good work. And it's probably 
um, helping keep some people out of hospital. It's not going to generate the savings to uh, actually um, more, more effectively put a, a sizable enough resource into the community sector. The barriers to that remain immense. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Who's, I know somebody, this gentleman here. Thank you. I'm uh, Nasser Nabi. I'm a GP in Newcastle again. Um, from 2004, GPs have no longer been responsible for out of hours care. Since then, there has been a rise in A&E attendances and a fall in patient satisfaction of out of hours care, as well as a rise in the costs. Do the panel think that there are any lessons to be learnt when considering the cost and quality of in hours care from the experience of out of hours care? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Linda to come through, but I think it's a very interesting issue, but I think we've got to be clear about the facts because actually I think we know that the rise in the emergency department attendances has probably risen in the same rate as the population rather than risen in excess of the population. And in fact, the rise of people attending general practice services has risen far greater than the rise in ED. So I think the question is a really good one. It's about how, because I think there is an issue about quality for out of hours. I think there is a grave issue about quality and variability of quality. But I think it's... It, you know, for the sake of the GPs in this audience, I don't think it's related to us not doing out of hours because I think there's not. Would you like to say, I, um, Bolton is absolutely fantastic, is it? <laughs> um, no, I'm not going to say that. Um, I, I just know that I get a lot of complaints from the public about out of hours. The, the thing about the thing you've got to realise as GPs is that the public actually love you and they trust you far more than they do politicians. And out of That's hours. A low bar. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, and obviously, out of hours, they want to see their GP, so that they don't find it a very adequate service. And I think that's consequently why a lot of people do turn up at A&E. Uh, certainly, A&Es in, in, in industrial areas are very, very overstretched. Um, I don't quite know a solution, because this is sort of something that will have to be de 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 you know, delivered nationally. And I'm not quite sure what GPs think about providing their own in-house service. Obviously, previously you didn't didn't agree with it, but it is something that the public are really, really not happy about. And I do hope that you will you will look at it more seriously. I don't know how you achieve it because I certainly don't want to be seen by a doctor who's been on call for 18 hours. Uh, you know, I appreciate you know shouldn't shouldn't talk about these things until you've tried them. But I do think we need to do something. And I think if we could get an improvement in that, I think I do think actually, Claire, A and E. Uh, attendances would go down slightly. So Stephen, something needs to be done. Clearly if we had <laughs> more resources we might be able to do something but what's, what's your sense because you were presumably Secretary of State when GPs did do out of hours as well as in hours and it was following that that uh, 2004 contract that it started to shift and whatever one feels about that contract it did relieve us of the responsibility. So your Secretary of State again what do you suggest? Yeah, we had a big argument with uh, the BMA at the time, Ian Bogle, who some of you may remember was a GP from Liverpool, tough negotiator on behalf of GPs. A new out of hours uh, settlement at the time was negotiated uh, when Ian was uh, chairman of the BMA. And the principle that I sought to safeguard was not that GPs had to work absurd hours, because that's in no one's interest. It's not in your interest as GPs. It's not in the patient's interest, plainly. Uh, but I do think the principle that uh, the practice or the GP retains responsibility for a patient right through their pathway of care is fundamental to the principle of joined up care. And the, the, uh, to, be, you, to be clinically accountable uh, for the service delivered to a patient doesn't mean you have to be there all the time. Consultants are clinically accountable for the care delivered uh, to their patients when they're in hospital. They're not on, on court. They're not in the hospital 24 hours a day. So the principle of accountability seems to me to be important, and I regret the fact that was lost uh, in 2004. And it's important, as you rightly said, Claire, on quality grounds. That's what the professional obligation of a, of a GP is to their patient, right through their pathway of care, it seems to me. Uh, in terms of the precise question you asked, does this have 
uh, are there lessons to be learned from 2004 in terms of the arrangements for uh, the care in hours? I, I'm not quite certain what you're driving at, to be perfectly honest, but my core principle is the one that I define, that uh, the GP ought to retain clinical accountability uh, for their patient through their pathway of care because that's how you deliver the medical input into a more community-based service with responsibility for the full pathway of care, including the social care and the other elements, which doesn't necessarily, and this is a point that I think needs to be thought through beyond where we are now, doesn't necessarily involve the GP in, uh, personally being involved in that at all. GPs are not social workers and shouldn't be social workers, but there should be engagement in that uh, joined up pathway of care, otherwise the words we were using in answer to one of the previous questions are simply that, words. Mm. Thank you. And Judith, Cornwall has its particular challenges, not least its rurality, its size, and the fact that you can't quickly magic up uh, a, a whole workforce. You can probably do that in, in some of the inner cities. And I understand the out-of-hours service has some issues about it. Uh, what's, what's your sense of the question? Well, uh, I'll start by making a confession. Um, I was a PCT chair in Cornwall and uh, sat on the, the panel that looked at all of the bids. And we, we, we're worrying about bids in this new world, but bids are nothing new. Mm. Um, I, I looked at the bids for the out-of-hours service in Cornwall and without a shadow of a doubt, the best one in front of us and the people who presented the most effectively and, and, and made the, uh, and, and it, was, uh, it was done on finance as well, was, was actually Serco. And uh, certainly uh, there's a Cornish GP sitting on the front, front here. Any and more she... Cornish GPs? <laughs> <laughs> Another Cornish GP. Oh, lots, lots. You can tell by the suntans. Serco have not been... <laughs> not being a universal success. Uh, they made all sorts of assumptions that I guess looking back we should have picked up on and we were all new to this game. And I've, th I've thought many times if we could, had looked at this slightly different would things, things be different. Um, but to, look, to come back to, to the question really, um, the whole issue around access to care, quality has to be uppermost. But in, in terms of somebody's first point of contact with the NHS, we've got GPs, we've got the ambulance service, we've got out of our service, we've got um, uh, walk-in walk centres, centers, pharmacies, we've got, we've got loads. And that, they've all sort of grown up on their own. And I, I don't like using integration over and over again. But there does need to be some sort of joined up common standards, common threads, common linkages, a, a standardised health record would help that was, was universally accessible. Uh, but to, to make a point about, in, in Cornwall we have uh, two hospitals, yeah, two, two major hospitals in Cornwall, uh, plus loads of, loads of community hospitals that in fact, the, the old health board tried to close, for, and Frank Dobson came down and, and uh, waved a magic wand and, and saved them all. And in fact, I think probably people are fairly pleased that he did, because we can now use them as step up and step down. But uh, we have minor injury units based in all of those hospitals, and they are actually that. They are minor injury units, and they, they take away from GPs some things. Uh, they certainly help our A&Es. And... Uh, that's perhaps a model that might be replicated elsewhere. I know it is being replicated elsewhere, but we had to really fight very hard with general practitioners who thought that the world would end if we had nurse-led units in our hospitals. Thank you very much. I'm going to could ask I, Olivia... Could I, could I come back to that? Yes, of course yeah. you can. If you could be brief, though. Yes, thank you. Um, my question was really around trying to gauge the panel's understanding of both the quality and cost-effectiveness of general practice in its current form. And... Um, I'm not sure that the panel have understood that from the replies that they've given. Um, there was, I think, a miscalculation of the cost effectiveness and the quality of work provided by GPs out of hours. Um, they, it was valued at £3,000. My, um, <coughs> my fear, I think my concern, is that they are once again miscalculating 
all the good work that's done up and down the country in ours, and they're once again making the same mistake in terms of tendering out lots of different parts of the contract to other bidders. Thank you. I, I must say that's a very good question. But to be fair to the panel, I didn't hear that was the question, but uh, I no, think I maybe... No, if, I didn't get that So time. maybe we can answer that question at a later point and pick up some of those issues. I think, and it's a very, very good question about undervaluing what we do, and the, the great example of that was undervaluing our out-of-hours contribution, and we're at risk now of undervaluing general practice, and as we read, we're anywhere from 400 million to a billion short. But, Olivia. Um, my name's Olivia Hum, I'm a GP in Sussex. Um, a lot of time and expense is being put in at the moment to reorganise services to suit working people. The majority of those, however, who need to use our services are the elderly and those with chronic conditions, people with young children, who typically want to see a doctor during the weekdays. Our time is a finite resource and GPs are in short supply. We can't simply carry on increasing the hours we work without risking exhaustion and burnout. If we work at the weekend for the convenience of the largely healthy working population, we'll be depriving the majority of our patients from a weekday service. How do you plan to reconcile this? Linda, you, you, you picked up you don't want to be seen by a doctor who's just done an 18-hour shift, but uh, clearly you have already said that you want your GP to be available. How do you reconcile the needs of the working, in fact, as we've heard, the hard working, <laughs> because we are not hard working. <laughs> What's your view of that question? Right, well, I did hear you, Claire, on, on the television, sort of putting that point of view forward the other night, so I've thought about it. Um, some GPs do, actually. I know, I, know, I know of GPs that do open at seven, till 7 o'clock in the evening so that people who do it... I think we've got to recognise that we're in, a, we're in a different world now. We're in a 24-7 uh, lifestyle where, where many people do work unusual hours and actually the only time they would be able to get to see you would be what you would call an out of hours at a time. So I think you have to, I think you'll have to accept as GPs that there will have to be some provision. The, the only other thing is we probably need more doctors, don't we? But are we going to have more money for more doc doctors? And regrettably, as for the last three years in local government, as our budgets have been absolutely um, massively slashed, I can't see any, I can't see, I, I can only see you being asked to work longer hours for the same pay um, and I think you are going to be told to do that by, but just the, the but is feeling. it safe I mean would you like your uh, airline pilot uh, who's just done an no. 11 hour flight and you no. then say well I'm really sorry we're, we're paying you and you're Claire, now I'm not agreeing I'm not no, saying no, it's good I did say earlier I don't want to be seen by somebody mm. who is posed on an 18 hour shift um, but, but I, I, I think that's the reality of what you're going to be asked to do I, I suppose we could be we could stand up for you and say no you don't do that that, but I, I think there will be a directive that you do 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 that shortly. That seems to be Jeremy Hunt's way forward. I don't know. Um, just with regards to the integration money, we're told there's going to be 3.8 billion for that. I doubt if all that will come forward. And in local authorities, I, I don't know whether you understand how local authorities have been hit, but our controllable budgets are the only budgets that we can make savings from. Our largest controllable budget is adult social care, 60, about, in my area, about 65 million. Our children that are looked after, another, what? Well, by the time we've finished, the only money that we will have will be to deliver those two services. And the way it's going, we won't, be able, we won't have enough to deliver that, those services either. So I, you do have my sympathies, because I don't want to see you working longer. But I think you need to, you need to know that there is a public groundswell that want to see, and I think the government will um, will bend to that groundswell, and I think you will be asked to do it. I think you need to demand that we have more doctors in the system in order that we can deliver that. Thank you. I'm going to ask Judith and, and Stephen, and I'm aware of about 35 million hands up. The <laughs> <laughs> so I will, not in the style of any questions, allow people to respond to that, but only briefly, no big long essays, <laughs> no references at the end of it, Okay, briefly, brief. Judith. <laughs> yes. I, I think the points that Linda made are, are well made, but I don't understand quite how some practices do manage to do this and other practices don't. And 
you'll know that better than I do. And certainly I, I know um, I can have a telephone conversation with my GP. Now, some practices do do that and some practices don't. Some GPs will accept email and, and others won't. You know, they guard their email address really, really um, to their, close to their bosom. Um, and, and I think some of the solution to this is with you looking at things. I mean, we're not, I don't think anyone's suggesting that a whole team should remain on duty from half past seven in the morning till half past eight at night and, and all weekend. But I, I do think there is, where people are having to travel further for work, I think there, there should be an opportunity for people to see their GP, otherwise they will pitch up in A&E. And, and certainly there is evidence to a certain extent that's happening. And I think young, young people of the iPhone generation, um, I've got a Blackberry so I don't count as one of those, but, but it, I, I just think it would be really sensible if somebody devised an app you know, if I feel under the weather and I press my Pauli app, you could actually have a quick triage to say whether it's actually important I should see the doctor like now or next week would wait. Um, or <laughs> all right, all right. I will move, we'll move. By the way, if you want to know a doctor's email address, just get their name, dot, surname, NHS, and the, dot net. That every, we all have to use NHS net. Yeah, but, but will they reply? That's the oh, well, that's a, that's a moot point. It's some, some of those go into cyberspace. NHS net make you change your password every six weeks, and then you forget what your password is, and then you get locked out forever. So <laughs> it's one of the unintended consequences of information governments. Steve? Uh, it's precisely why I don't use the House of Commons <laughs> email service, because I can never remember what I've changed my uh, yeah. password to. Um, the, uh, we talked earlier about silos, and discussion of this tends to go on in silos. We were talking ten minutes ago about the importance of more joined up services in order to prevent, to intervene early, and an important part of the reasoning for that uh, was to avoid unnecessary demand being placed on the acute service. So when we're talking about resourcing healthcare, we have to remember all parts of the argument at the same, uh, at the same time, it seems to me. The NAO estimate is that 30% of the demand presented in the acute sector is avoidable, not unnecessary when the patient arrives, but avoidable. Now, if you reckon that the acute sector spends 60 billion pounds a year, it's not difficult arithmetic to work out the scale of resource that's available if we can actually deliver a service that is accessible to people at the, uh, and does intervene early, is a properly front-ended service rather than a service that waits for the illness to become acute and only then commits resources to it. So the, the discussion about access to uh, community-based services is part of the discussion uh, about uh, joined-up services in order to achieve early intervention and prevention. So, yes, I am in favour of a more flexible model for the delivery of primary care in order to deliver the rhetoric that we were all talking about ten minutes, quarter of an hour ago. But does that mean every practice has to open eight to eight? Of course it doesn't. And it's the curse of the health service is to think that because we've got a model that works for one group of patients in one place, therefore it's got to be rolled out everywhere. That's how not to plan a health and care service. And it's why, in answer to the first question, I said it has to be both local and national. The national objective is ready access in order to achieve timely intervention. The local application of that principle will vary widely depending on the type of patient and the type of area we're dealing with. Yeah, I, I, I think that's very good. I've got some hands up. Raj Meechler, you've got to... Come, and if you want to ask, um, shout you. No, I don't want a new question. Uh, anybody <laughs> want to respond to this one? I just want to know about the GP working during the week, then why do these patients manage to um, go and see their doctors in hospital during the week and take time off work to go and see a, a consultant during the week, but they're not prepared to see their GP? The hard-working people. Keep putting the hard-working, please. <laughs> I'm please. Just, I'm just really surprised why you, yeah, know, yeah, it's you very want good to question. Why do these hard-working people, are they able to take time out, usually a whole day, 
because that's what it takes when you go to the doctor in the hospital, as we all know. But these same hard-working people have to see us on a Sunday to get their cervical smear because they can't take time out, when actually yeah. we can offer them an appointment time within 15 to 20 minutes without any waiting. Stephen. Well, some, with great respect, some practices do and some don't. Mm. Uh, and I, the, the principle that I pitch camp on, and I'm unapologetic about it, is that the service isn't as accessible as it needs to be to achieve early intervention, proper preventive practice. And if we doubt that, just look at the number of avoidable acute cases that present without having missed the opportunity uh, to encourage early, early present. It is exactly the question, The question Claire. is, why do these hard-working people able to take time off to go to well, hospital? But you present two alternatives, hard-working people going to hospital or going to GPs on a Sunday. I present the third alternative, which is ready access that doesn't require them to take a day off at all. Right, I'm going to ask two more for this and then move on. Richard, Shout, Richard, stand. Hey, same question for hardworking people. My vet, my dentist, my hairdresser, I would take time from work. Okay, thank you. Another hard-working person. Um, just, just to say, my concern is I think we've all agreed there's a shortfall of GPs and everyone's agreed you know, there's a shortfall of at least 2,000, likely to be even more. But if these conditions are coming in, longer working hours, no pay, no additional resource coming in to fill the actual black hole, my concern is how are you going to recruit these 2,000 to 10,000 okay. GPs? Well, I'm sure we'll get that question. By the way, I go to my hairdresser on a Saturday. I have to be honest. I go in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> One more comment stand is it a new question no it's a silly question but it's stand to stand by the put 50 million pounds into the pilot study for eight to eight when already my is 77 and it works really well very creative what resource they've got um, but yeah i'm a rough sense of carers as well and people are different and i'm trying to try to get mental health checks and carers now they're hard working and they're the ones that hold the community together get absolutely it work if you don't have a family carer for long-term conditions and people with autism. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'll, I'll say, uh, don't worry. I'm, and I'm going to ask, I'm actually going to ask uh, Keith Miller to ask the, the no, sorry, Liv, no, Keith Miller's next. Is Keith here? Yes, your next question. Uh, the question was, the, the statement here was about uh, a hidden group which we know about, which is carers. And, and I think, to be fair to the panel, what they've said is we need to be looking at flexibility. There isn't going to be any new resources. We need to be continuing, as I've heard, lobbying government to say, look, you get more money, more bucks for your, your money if you invest in primary care. But equally, we need to be giving the message out and we need to be trying to offer more flexibility. You can get an app, by the way, as somebody said, 111, and, okay. and uh, it doesn't work, though. That's a problem because it's very... When I looked up on mine and tweeted, I think I've got Ebola virus because I had myalgia. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, because I put myalgia into the... Uh, I had quite bad myalgia. And somebody then tweeted, but didn't you have a cold last week? Isn't this post-viral myalgia? And I said, oh, yes, thank you. So the app told me I had Ebola virus. And for about, about a minute, I was very upset. Uh, Keith Miller. And this might well be the last question, but... Uh, Okay, um, I'm a GP from Leeds and um, clinical lead for long-term conditions in Leeds West. Uh, my question was really, that we had some fairly unexpected changes to the health and social care uh, provision after the uh, last election. If you were successful at the next election, but were guaranteed to be in office for 10 years rather than five, what would general practice, community health care, social care look like by the end of that time? <laughs> Who would like to go first on their party? <laughs> Stephen, would you like to go first? You're now the Secretary of State for Health for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, the people would leave the health service in droves. Um, the, uh, the, the key... Uh, 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 Judith uh, said she didn't want to be to focus every answer on uh, integration, what I prefer to call joined up care. Actually, until we've got a Secretary of State who does focus virtually every answer on joined up care, I don't think we're going to win. Uh, because the, and joined up means understanding the roles that different people can play. What I just wanted to hark back to the previous conversation a moment, actually, is to ensure that we remember. Uh, that the phrases primary care, general practice, 
are not the same thing, mm -hmm. and primary care, general practice, and community care, community health, are not the same thing. Until we've rethought how we use uh, the skills that are available, both in the health workforce and in the social care workforce, in order to deliver effective intervention in people's lives at the time we can do most for them, including, and I entirely agree the lady from the carer community, when you make an assessment about the health and care needs of an individual, it needs to be of that individual in their social context. Uh, that's what the service needs to look like if we're going to spend money on enabling people to get more out of their additional life years rather than simply endure them. The health economist's favorite measure, uh, quality, we m more often end up talking about ollies than we do about qualies. And that, well, my objective would be to change the system so that it was, as Mike Farrer uh, has said, a, a care system with what he calls a health adjunct, I hate the word adjunct, but a care system w that can call on medical and clinical support when necessary, rather than a medical system which relies on care which is not available uh, at the level that we should want it. Thank you. Judith, you're Secretary of State. I'm Secretary of State. Uh, it, it's the time of year when, or it's the time within a parliament when political parties start thinking about a general election and about manifestos and about what would. And I think there's, there's something that would really help any community, whether, whatever they're delivering in planning, is actually budgets not done on an annual basis but a five yearly basis so that you could actually look, look ahead and plan ahead and, and not have to sort of second guess what that next year might bring. So, so I think I, I might suggest that, that that would be a good, a good start. Um, something that, as Liberal Democrats have said, we, we do not think that we should change any of the uh, architecture after, after the last effort. We, did, we would not go into the next gen... Well, indeed they did. And, and I, when I was at my we very first... that quip. What was the quip you that's made? That's what the last lot said. Oh, that's what the last lot said. Absolutely. And, and it was, uh, uh, I got my knuckles severely wrapped for, in my, my very first speech in the House of Lords for, uh, uh, about, about that um, and taking the government to task. And I was reminded that I was actually part of the government. <laughs> 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 anyway. But, but you, are, you are absolutely right. But well, the, the, let's be serious. The changes and the, and the things that we're talking about today don't need any legislation. They actually, they actually need you, you and your colleagues in all the other royal colleges and the RCN and patients to actually sit down and say, is this the right way to deliver healthcare in the 21st century? And it isn't just healthcare, it's social care too. And that, that has to be part of a really big conversation. And uh, the uh, Royal College of Physicians have just put together a, a really interesting report about the hospital of the future. Uh, they, involve, they involve patients. And, and I think it's something that need, will only work if it actually is grown from the bottom, and, and that, that's, that's you, rather than enforced from the top. And, and I think the sooner you realise that, the better. Thank you. It's a pity, though, that sometimes politicians don't listen to what we, we produce. We've produced a, a vision 10-year strategy for general practice, but uh, unfortunately... How much of it needs legislation, Claire? None of it. But we so need political will to help, because if on the, the back of that you get announcements every five minutes which completely cut across a coherent strategy from all sorts of... Then, I mean, I'm not blaming any political party, but I think there is a tendency for politicians to maybe, because quite rightly, it's a big budget to, to not, to reinvent the, the, the past and just each time you get into power to rip up what's gone on before and then to reinvent it. Is that right, Linda? Are you going to reinvent the past and, or are you going to actually start from where we are and make a better health service? You're a 10 year Secretary of State for Health. Right. Well, obviously Andy, Andy Burnham is our shadow, shadow minister and you've probably all heard um, what he wants to do and he doesn't want to rip up what, what's, what's in place now um, but what he does want to do is he wants to give local authorities the commissioning function because he doesn't believe in the provider commissioner um, uh, dual, dual role, he believes in the split uh, which is I think something that somebody said earlier that until you get all your commissioning at one point you, you're, not going, you're not going to be able to deliver, it's going to be too 
too fragmented. So, so that's his, his big idea, which I, I think personally, and I would, wouldn't I, because I chair of health and wellbeing board, but I think that would bring a, a, a lot more harmony uh, to, uh, to the situation. But one of the things that we're starting to do now that I, I desperately hope will work is on the integrated model. We've got to the stage where we're talking about our population is just over a quarter of a million, putting in multidisciplinary teams around practices of about 20,000 people, around GP clusters of about 20 to 30,000 people. And in those multidisciplinary teams, there will be all, all aspects of, of, of care, of social care, of um, medical care. And hopefully that will take some of the strain off what you were doing as GPs, because we're also going to introduce key workers for people. We're trying to get intermediate services much better, the step up, step down. The step up should be the one where we're concentrating all our efforts. We shouldn't be um, having, as I say, elderly people ending up in hospitals and then having to come out and all the reablement issues. We've got, as local authorities, we've got to get that much better. We know that, we recognise that, and the pressures are on you if we don't do that. Um, I think we need more prevention. I certainly think uh, we need to spend the money, the public health money that's ring fenced, um, so perhaps better. And we need to link in, as Marmot said, on housing, um, on early years development, all these kinds of things which all help towards people's well-being. You know, start with a child earlier and get them not just eating correctly and exercising, but give them some aspiration and you'll have healthier people in the future that won't be a burden on GPs and support your carers. Uh, you know, you need, we need to have centres where carers can come and talk and discuss things and feel supported. More often than that, and I actually said to Claire earlier, I shared a platform some time ago at a Labour Party conference where there was a lady who'd cared for her uh, elderly husband for 16 years. She wanted to do the care, but what she needed was somebody to be an, an advocate for her. I think if you bring key workers in, again, that will take some of the strain, some of the pressure off the health service. So that's my brain. Well. There's somebody here who's been very patient. If it's a quick question. Uh, very quick. It's uh, David Rapley, Midland Faculty Chair. Um, it's, it's really uh, alluding to what you've all said. Uh, we are witnessing the uh, football of health being kicked around between the parties. And you probably all notice that there's a coalition at the moment. So how about a coalition of all parties and take it out of politics? Maybe do it for education as well. Can we do the same for education? <laughs> so, would you all three agree in a coalition of health and take it out of politics? I suspect at £120 billion, somebody needs to be accountable, but... Uh, I think that you've put your finger on it, Claire. You will, I am absolutely in favour of seeking cross-party agreement where it exists and not exaggerating differences that don't exist. And uh, as, I've sought to, as I've said many times, including this morning, Actually, the differences between the two front benches in terms of many aspects of health policy, not all of them, but many of them, you can't put a cigarette paper between them and pretending otherwise is silly. Uh, but are you ever going to get to the point where in a, the run-up to a general election, the parties aren't going to compete uh, to demonstrate to voters what they're going to do with £125 billion. This is not merely the largest public service. This is the size of all the other public services put together. Uh, it's what people, and it's what people care about. So it, it, it comes up on the doorstep more often than the dreaded subject Europe does. Many, many times more, politicians will talk about it. Judith. Well... I think that's absolutely right and certainly there have been instances over the last couple of years where there have been talks and on the, uh, the care bill that's currently going through both houses there have been extensive cross-party talks and cross-party agreement and, and clearly there, there are areas around the edges where there, there is disagreement but that, that has been an example of how to actually put a bill through, whereas I think probably in re it's, hindsight's brilliant and there was, there was speed and all sorts of other imperatives. The health and social care bill was probably an example of, of the way it shouldn't go through. Thank you for saying that. That's very sweet of you. <laughs> On behalf of the government. Um, no, 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 no. 
No. That's just don't that's, tweet. So don't, don't tweet it. Do not print it. Come on, this is. I ban you. I'll just tweet get it. into trouble when I you, go back. You, you, you will be. You'll get your fellowship and your membership and, uh, removed. And those of you that aren't a fellow or a member won't get it. Right, Linda. Yeah, well, I mean, there is, there is a big difference, also, from our point, from our point, from my party's point of view, is that you know we we delivered the, the the NHS and we're very very protective of it, and it's public money and the public out there see it as the number one institution in the country. As you say, we get we get asked about this a lot on the doorstep, so you know. That is our starting point, it, you know, free at the point of delivery, and we're not too happy about um, a lot of the competitive tendering. And, and one of the things I didn't say earlier was if, if I had my way, I'd end foundation trusts. I don't yes. believe that they should be there to, um, you know, as, as, a, as a business um, competing against each other. It, it's, it's, it's not right. Um, but I think if you if you go down a level, but you know, I think you're talking about national level. Uh, if you go down a level and you actually look at what we've been doing at the local government association, I was talking earlier about it. The way we operate, we operate on consensus. And although there, at the moment there are more conservative and liberal um, councillors in the country than there are Labour, so they actually form you know the, the majority of the seats there. We do work very, very closely, and if you talk to a lot of um, councillors around the country, what, from whatever party, we're all saying the same thing, because we end up having to deliver any government's agenda, whether we like it or not. And I think at the moment, especially over the, the health bill, over the health and wellbeing boards, we're all singing off the same page, really, uh, same hymn sheet as, as councillors around the country. And what we tend to do is put the local government family first and the people first. So I think if, if our people at the top could get some common ground, um, I'm not quite sure how, how, I think there is quite a big gap in some of it, uh, Stephen. Um, you probably know better than I do. But I think if, you know, at local level, I think we could work together. And I think with all this integration that we're, going, we're trying to deliver now, I think you will see a slightly different picture on the ground than what is actually being said in Parliament. Thank you very, very much. Well, what we've heard from these three fantastic uh, folk coming all this way to Harrogate is they're going to commit to more investment in primary care. <laughs> They're going to commit. You can tweet that. You can tweet that. They're going to commit to far more GPs on the ground, and they're going to commit to making sure that every time they open their mouth, they say, "What a fantastic profession we That's have, true. and how it's leading the NHS." So, can I just thank the fantastic? <laughs> It's a massively long. Right, we've got a, a, a plenary now, I think. Coffee. You have coffee. 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 Somebody's coffee. here.